This is chapter 28 of Laura Hillenbrand's book, Unbroken. Chapter 28 is called Enslaved, and we're jumping in at page 282. Hopefully you remember that in chapter 27, the bird had been transferred away from Ofuna, and uh, Louis was having a great life. He got some of his old friends back. They're all happy. Uh, and then at the end of the chapter, Louis, along with his guys, all got transferred to a new prisoner of war camp called Noetsu. And when they show up, uh, the first thing that happens is that Louis is greeted by the bird. And at the very end of chapter 27, which is called Falling Down, Louis falls down. He passes out when he realizes he's back at camp with the bird. And that is where we start our chapter today. Oh, wait. The bird was transferred from Amori. Afuna was their older POW camp. Anyway, they're at the new camp. Here's the bird. Here we go. It says, Louis would remember the moment when he saw the bird as the darkest of his life. For the bird, it was something else. He beamed like a child on his birthday. He seemed certain that the POWs were overjoyed to see him. Fitzgerald forked forward on his crutches and assumed the duties of senior POW. The bird announced that just as at Amori, he was in command and that the men must obey. He said that he would make his camp just as Amori had been under his tenure. Ringing with shock, Louis picked himself up and hiked through the snow to the barracks, a two-story building on the edge of a small cliff that dropped straight down to the frozen Hakura River. The 300 residents, mostly Australians, were shrunken down to virtual stick figures. Most were wearing the tropical weight khakis in which they'd been captured, and which, thanks to years of uninterrupted wear, were so ragged that one civilian likened them to seaweed. The wind scudding off the sea whistled through cracks in the walls, and there were so many holes in the roof that it snowed indoors. The whole building was visibly infested with fleas and lice, and rats trotted through the rooms. The beds were planks nailed into the walls. The mattresses were loose rice straw. Everywhere, there were large gaps in the floor, and POWs had pulled up the floorboards and burned them in an effort to survive temperatures that regularly plunged far below zero. Stacked against one wall were dozens of small boxes, some of which had broken open and spilled gray ash onto the floor. These were the cremated remains of 60 Australian POWs one in every five prisoners who had died in this camp in 1943 and 1944, succumbing to pneumonia, beriberi, malnutrition, col colitis, or a combination of these. So it says one in every five prisoners. So 20% of the prisoners are dying. And the ash that's spilling around the floor is their bodies, which were burned. So Louis has left a terrible place that got a little bit less terrible when the bird left. And now he's in this place that's just awful. Remember, it's buried in snow. They're freezing. People are dying. In a POW camp network that would resonate across history as a supreme example of cruelty, meaning all throughout history, this camp that Louis just been brought to is going to be known later as one of the most cruel camps ever anywhere. Noetsu had won a special place as one of the blackest holes in the Japanese empire. Of the many hells that Louis had known in this war, this place would be the worst. Louis lay on his plank and tried to ready himself for what Noetsu would bring. As he fell asleep that night, halfway around the globe, the world's best runners were gathering for a track meet at Madison Square Garden. The promoters had renamed the marquee event in tribute to Louis, who was still believed dead by virtually everyone outside of his family. When the Zamperinis heard of it, they were upset. The race was to be called the Louis S. Zamperini Memorial Mile. So meaning they're doing this like in Louis' memory because they think he's dead. They're having this big race. Out of respect for the family, the name was changed to the Louis S. Zamperini Invitational. But that did little to lift the spirits of those involved. Before we turn, um, you can see here that this is a picture of the POWs at Noetsu. Marty Glickman, who'd been on the 1936 Olympic team with Louis, watched the race with tears streaming down his face. The race was won by Jim Rafferty, America's best miler. His time was 4.16.4, four four seconds slower than the time Louis had clocked on the sand of Oahu just before climbing aboard Green Hornet. And 
if you've ever run on sand, you know, it's really difficult, meaning Louis could most certainly do better than this mile speed. But this is kind of showing us that like Louis could have been this great Olympian had he not crashed, had he not been captured. So it kind of makes the situation even more tragic, realizing that now Louis can barely stand sometimes because he's so sick. The first Louis spent in Noetsu were almost lethally cold. Each night of shivering in his bed of straw ended abruptly before dawn when he was shouted awake and forced outside for Tenko in deep snow, howling wind and darkness. By day, he huddled with Tinker, Wade, and his other friends in patches of sunlight, trying in vain to keep warm. He was soon nursing a cough, fever, and flu-like symptoms, and the Noetsu slop did nothing to help his body recover. The rations, which were halved for officers, rarely varied from millet or barley and boiled seaweed, plus a few slices of vegetable. The drinking water, which the POWs had to haul in on sleds, was yellow and reeked. Seeing the guards smoking American cigarettes, the POWs knew that the Red Cross was sending relief packages, but the prisoners got nothing. Watanabe was the same fiend that he'd been at Omori, prompting the Aussies, the Australians, to nickname him What a Bastard. He had a far lower rank than Noetsu's commander, an elfin man sporting an abbreviated mustache as an apparent homage to Hitler. So he has the little Hitler-style stash. But the commander deferred to the bird, just as the officers at Omori had done. So remember, the bird isn't actually in charge, but people usually act like he's in charge because they're scared of him. And here the bird had recruited a henchman, a sidekick, an eggplant-shaped man named Hiroki Kono, who trailed Watanabe around the camp, assaulting men with the intensity, wrote Wade, of a roaring Hitlerian animal. So a Hitler-like animal. Louis' transfer to Noetsu and into the grip of the bird had been no coincidence. Watanabe had handpicked him and the others to come to this camp, which was short on officers. According to Wade, each chosen man had a skill or history that would make him useful. Al Mead, who had helped save Louis from starvation at Ofuna, had headed Amori's cookhouse. Fitzgerald had been a ranking officer. Wade had been a barracks commander, and so on. The only man with no such history was Louis. Wade believed that the bird had chosen Louis simply because he wanted to torment him, which knowing the bird's history, we can kind of believe, right? He it really, really takes pleasure from this kind of torture, and he's out to get Louis. Wade was right. From almost the moment that Louis walked into the camp, the bird was on him, slapping him, punching him, and berating him, or like saying terrible things to him. Other POWs were shocked at how the sergeant pursued Louis, attacking him. Remembered one POW just for drill. Louis took his beatings with as much defiance as ever, provoking the bird to ever more violent attacks. Remember Louis rather than like looking down like he's lost. He's always going to look the bird right in the eyes. He's going to clench his fists and show that he's angry, which makes the bird even more angry. Once again, in his tormentor's clutches, Louis descended back into a state of profound stress. And yet, by virtue of his rank, Louis was fortunate. Noetsu was a factory village that generated products critical to the war effort, and all of its young workers had gone to war. The POWs were here to take their place. Each day, the enlisted POWs waded through the snow to labor in a steel mill, a chemical factory, the port's coal and salt barges, or at a site which they broke rocks for mineral extraction. The work was extraordinarily arduous and often dangerous. So they're doing really hard physical labor that's extremely difficult as well as dangerous. And shifts went on day and night, some for 18 hours. In the hikes back from the slave labor, men were so rubber-legged that they tumbled into snow crevasses and had to be dragged out. Each morning and night, Louis saw the enlisted men rambling in from their slave shifts, some completely obscured by coal soot, some so exhausted that they had to be carried into the barracks. Keep in mind, they're doing this hard physical labor while they're all sick and they're not getting food. So even if it would ordinarily be exhausting, it's far worse because of their physical state. The Japanese literally worked men to death at Noetso. Louis had much to bear, but at least he didn't have this. So remember that officers don't have to do slave labor. They only get half of the food ration because of that, but they're not doing this labor. Winter faded. 
the river ice gave way to flowing water and houses emerged where only snow had been. When the drifts in the compound melted, a pig miraculously appeared. All winter, he'd been living below the POWs in a snow cavern, sustained by bits of food dropped to him by an Australian. Louis looked at him in wonder. The animal's skin had gone translucent, see-through. With the ground thawed, the bird announced that he was sending the officers to work as farm laborers. Though this violated the Geneva Convention's prohibition on forcing officers to labor, Fitzgerald now knew what life in camp with the bird was like. So the Geneva Convention, those are like the laws of war, basically. And so there's a rule that says officers can't do labor, um, and this is going to violate that. Work on the farm would keep the officers out of the bird's path for hours every day and couldn't be anything like the backbreaking labor done by the enlisting men. Fitzgerald raised no protest, so they'd rather work than be around the bird. Each morning, Louis and the rest of the farming party assembled before the barracks, attended by a civilian guard named Ogawa. They loaded a cart with benjo waste, bathroom waste, to be used as fertilizer, as was customary in Japan, then yoked themselves to the cart like oxen and pulled it to and from the farm. So they have to carry the stuff from the bathroom to and from the fields on like a wagon kind of thing. As they picked their way along the road, sometimes starting off to try and steal a vegetable from a field while Ogawa's back was turned, Japanese farmers came out to stare at them, probably the first Westerners they'd ever seen. Louis looked back at the wan, stooped old men and women. The hardships of this war were evident on their blank, weary faces and from their bodies, winnowed for want of food. A few children scampered about, raising their arms in imitation of surrender and mocking the prisoners. There were no young adults. So they're kind of seeing like the Japanese civilians and there's kids and older people who they look like they're starving too, right? They don't have food, they don't have the things they need. And then there's no young adults because they are all either off in factories building things, they're all at the war, many of them have been killed. So we're seeing that this is taking a toll on Japan as well. The walk, six miles each way, was a tiring slog, but the work planting and tending potatoes was relatively easy. Ogawa was a placid man, calm, and though he carried a club, he never used it. The plot had a clean well, a relief after the stinking camp water, and Ogawa let the men drink all they wished, and because they were now working outside the camp, the officers were granted full rations. Though those rations were dwindling as Jap Japan's fortunes fell, a full bowl of seaweed was better than half a bowl of seaweed. April 13th was a bright day. The land bathed in sunshine, the sky wide and clear. Louis and the other officers were scattered over the potato plot working, when the field suddenly went still, and the men turned their faces to the sky. At the same moment, all over Nuetsu, labor at the outdoor work sites halted as the POWs and guards gazed up. High overhead, something was winking in the sunlight, slender ribbons of white unfurling behind it. It was a B-29. It was the first super fortress to cross over Nuetsu. The Amori officers had seen hundreds of B-29s over Tokyo, but for the Australians, who'd been hidden in this village since 1942, this was their first glimpse of the bomber. Followed by innumerable eyes, some hopeful and some horrified, the B-29 made a slow arc from one horizon to the other, following the coastline. No gun shot at it, no fighters chased it, it dropped no bombs, passing peacefully overhead, but its appearance was a telling sign of how far over Japan Americans were now venturing, and how little resistance the Japanese could offer. As all of Noetsu watched, the plane slid out of view, and its contrails dissolved behind it. So this is a really good sign. The B-29 is coming farther and farther over Japan, and Japan isn't fighting back. So for the Americans, for the Allies, this is a good sign of the end of the war coming. The POWs were elated. They're so happy. The Japanese were unnerved. At the work sites, the prisoners hid their excitement behind neutral faces to avoid provoking the guards. So they act like they're not excited, so the guards won't get mad. The guards were unusually tense and hostile. On the walk back to the camp that evening, the prisoners absorbed a few swipes with a club, but their mood remained merry. When they reached the gates, the bird was waiting for them. Roosevelt, he said, was dead. Remember Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, is the president of the United States during World War II. The men deflated. 
The bird sent them into the barracks. A few days later, Ogawa made a little joke to the bird, teasing him about how his POW officers were lazy. Ogawa meant no harm, but the remark sent the bird into a fury. He shouted for the farm workers to line up before him, then began berating them for their indolence. He stormed and frothed, seeming completely deranged, though he loses it. He's like crazy mad. Finally, he screamed his punishment. From now on, all officers would perform hard labor, loading coal on barges. If they refused, he would execute every one of them. One look at the bird told Fitzgerald that this was an order he could not fight. Early the next morning, as the officers were marching off to labor, the bird stood by watching them go. He was smiling. It was a short walk into slavery. The officers were taken to the riverbank and crowded into a barge, which was heaped with coal destined for the steel mill. Six men were given shovels. Louis and the rest were given large baskets and told to strap them to their backs. Then on the guard's orders, the shovelers began heaving coal into each man's basket. A cubic foot of loose coal can weigh as much as 60 pounds. The bearers were soon staggering. Once the baskets were full, the bearers were ordered to lug the loads off the barge and up the shore to a railroad car where they wobbled up a narrow, steep ramp, dumped the coal into the car, and returned to have their baskets filled. Now picture, they're wobbling, because remember, they don't have the strength to do this kind of labor, so they're just barely able to stay on their feet as they lug these big baskets of coal around. All day, the men shoveled and hauled. The guards kept the basket men moving at a rapid clip. By the time the guards finally let them stop, the men were utterly exhausted. By Wade's estimate, over the course of the day, each basket bearer had carried well over four tons of coal. Remember, one ton is 2,000 pounds. So began a daily routine. Each time the men finished clearing one barge, they were pushed aboard another, and the hauling went on, punishing their bodies and numbing their minds. Somewhere along the way, as he and the others bent under the burdens and plodded along, Tom Wade began reciting poetry and speeches. Louis and the other slaves shoveled and walked in time with Shakespeare's soliloquies, with Churchill's vow to fight in the fields and in the streets and in the hills, with Lincoln's last full measure of devotion. So one guy is reciting all this poetry, and that's kind of what they're working to. The barges were eventually empty, but the officer's life in slavery had only just begun. In a mass of POWs, Louis was herded into another of the barges, which was pulled by a tugboat into the Sea of Japan. About three quarters of a mile out, the barge drew alongside an anchored coal ship and stopped, the sea heaving under it, water spraying over the deck. Standing before the prisoners, a guard gestured to a net slung over the side of the ship. Jump from the barge onto the net, he said, then climb up onto the ship's deck. The POWs were appalled. On the tossing sea, the two vessels were pitching up and down, crashing together and rolling apart, and the net was a rapidly moving target. If the men mistimed their jumps, they'd be caught between the crafts as they collided or thrown into the water as they gapped apart. The men balked, but the guards forced them forward, and the POWs began jumping. Louis, as scared as everyone else, sprang across and climbed clear. So they're supposed to jump between boats and just try not to get smashed in the middle. He was hustled into the ship's hold. Before him stood a giant dome of coal, and beside it, a large hanging net. As he was given a shovel, the guard suddenly teamed around him, screaming at him to get to work. Louis jammed his shovel into the coal and began piling it into the net. Hour after hour, Louis stooped over his shovel in a churning cloud of black dust. The guards turned circles around him and the others, shouting and cracking them with clubs and kendo sticks. They pushed the POWs at such a frenzied pace, crazy, fast, frantic pace, that the laborers never had a moment to straighten their backs. Clubbed and badgered, Louis shuffled so frantically that the men alongside him whispered to him to slow down. At last, in the evening, the work was halted. The POWs were taken back to shore and dropped there, so caked in coal that they were virtually indistinguishable. So they're all just covered in coal dust, so you can't even tell who's who. Every morning, the men were sent back to take up their shovels again. Every night, they dragged back into camp, a long line of blackened ghosts trudging into the barracks and falling onto their bunks, weary to their bones, spitting back saliva. There was just one bathtub in camp, and its water was almost never changed. The one other place to bathe was a vat at the steel mill, but the guards marched the POWs there for baths 
only once every 10 days. Unwilling to brave the camp tub, the coal labor men lived in a patina of soot, waiting to go to the mill. So they just stay with soot coated on their skin uh, until their every 10th day they get a bath. Eventually, Wade felt so befouled, so nasty, that he had someone shave the coal-clotted hair from his head. It was an act of expiation, he wrote. Day after day, Louis shoveled. Occasionally, he was switched from coal to industrial salt. The work was just as taxing, and the salt liquefied in his sweat and ran down his back, burning fissures in his skin. Fitzgerald labored alongside his men and tangled with the foreman to protect them. Once, during a non-stop 14-hour shift, he ordered the POWs to stop and told the foreman that he wouldn't let his men work until they were fed. After much argument, the overseers brought the men a single huge ball of rice, then sent them back to work. Tragedy was inevitable, and Louis was there when it happened. He was standing on the barge, awaiting his turn to jump to the ship, when the man ahead of him mistimed his leap, thudding into the side of the ship just as it collided with the barge. Crushed between the vessels, the man crumpled onto the barge. The guards hardly paused, pushing Louis to make his jump. While the rest of the POWs tramped past him, the injured man was left where he lay. Louis never learned if he survived. And this becomes their daily life, just day after day, hard, dangerous labor. They're bound to get hurt eventually. No one really cares. They move on. The slave labor at Noetsu was the kind of work that swallowed men's souls. But the prisoners found ways to score little victories so essential to their physical and emotional survival. Remember, we've talked about this all throughout the book, that there's this need to maintain your dignity. Even if what's happening is terrible, if you can maintain your humanity and feel like you can still have little scraps of that, then you can maybe survive. And so they're saying here, this work would just eat your whole soul, but they're going to find little rebellious ways to make sure they survive. Most of the work sites offered nothing to sabotage, but stealing was epidemic. Everyone's stealing. On the barges, men would wait until the operator stepped away, then sprint into the galley, into like the kitchen, and stuff all the food they could find into their clothes. The lunch boxes of the civilian guards kept vanishing. An overseer's pack of cigarettes set down while he turned away would be gone when he turned back. The POWs would pinch or steal anything they could, often items they had no need for, risking a beating or worse, for something as useless as a pencil box. The box itself was nothing. The theft of it was everything. So it's not like they need a pencil box, but stealing helps them maintain their humanity. It's the way that they can rebel against their captors. Because the POW diet was severe, severely deficient in sodium, so there's not enough salt in their diet, leaving many men crippled by muscle cramps and other ailments, the men developed a system for stealing and processing salt. As they worked, the men on the salt barges would secrete handfuls of salt in their pockets. In its raw form, the salt was inedible, so you can't eat it like it is there. So the bargemen would carry it up to the campsite and slip it to the POWs assigned to the steel mill. These men would hide the salt in their clothing and carry it to the mill, wait until the guard wasn't looking, then drop lumps of it into canteens filled with water. At day's end, they'd hang the canteens on the sides of a coal fire vat. By morning, the water would be boiled away, leaving only edible salt residue, a treasure beyond price. So they do this whole process to cleverly make sure they get salt they can eat. Similar to how in the last camp they were stealing sugar to help keep people alive, now it's salt. While in the Benjo one day, Louis looked through a knot hole and noticed that a grain sack was resting against it in a storage room on the other side of the wall. Remembering the thieving techniques of the Scots at Amori, he left the Benjo, searched the camp, and found a pile of discarded bamboo reeds, which were hollow. He took one, and when the guards weren't watching, sharpened the end. That night, he put on his camp-issued pajamas, which were fitted with strings around the ankles. He pocketed his bamboo reed, pulled his ankle strings as tight as he could, and headed to the Benjo. Once inside, he jammed one end of the reed through the knot hole hard enough to pierce the grain sack, then put the other end into his pajama fly. The grain, rice, poured through the reed and into his pants. When he had about five pounds in each leg, Louis pulled the reed out. So he goes into the bathroom, sticks his bamboo, basically, pipe into this rice sack, and fills his PJ pants with rice. 
Louis had walked out of the benjo, moving as naturally as a man could with ten pounds of rice in his pajamas. He strolled past the barracks guards and climbed the ladder to the second floor, where Commander Fitzgerald awaited him, a blanket spread before him. Louis stepped onto the blanket, untied his pant legs, and let the rice spill out, then hurried back to his bunk. Fitzgerald quickly folded up the blanket, then hid the rice and socks in secret compartments he had made under the wall panels. After memorizing the guards' routines, Louis and Fitzgerald would wait for a time when the guards left the building, then dig out the rice, rush it to the building stove, boil it in water, and scoop it into their mouths as rapidly as they could, sharing it with few others. They never got more than about a tablespoon of rice per man, but the accomplishment of outwitting their slaveholders was nourishment enough. So it's not that they get a lot of rice through, through this, right? A little spoonful is all they get. But they get to, again, like defeat and rebel against the guards. In Nuezzo, little POW insurgency, or excuse me, in Nuezzo's little POW insurgency, or like fighting back, perhaps the most insidious feat was pulled off by Louis's friend, Ken Marvin, a Marine who'd been captured at Wake Atoll. By his work site, Marvin was supervised by a one-eyed civilian guard called Bad Eye. When Bad Eye asked Marvin to teach him English, Marvin saw his chance. With secret delight, he began teaching Bad Eye catastrophically bad English. So Louis teaching him English, but it's all wrong. From that day forward, when asked, how are you? Bad Eye would smilingly reply, what the fuck do you care? <laughs> That's what Louis taught him. Disaster struck Louis one day that spring on the riverbank. He'd been transferred back to hauling and was hunched under a basket, lugging a heavy load of salt from the barge to the railroad car. He carried his basket up the riverbank, then began the perilous walk up the rail car ramp. As he made his way up, a guard stepped onto the top of the ramp and started down. As they passed, the guard threw out his elbow, and Louis, top heavy under the basket, fell over the side. So this guard just elbows Louis, and because Louis's carrying all this weight, he falls over right away. He managed to get his legs under him before he hit the ground, some four feet down. One leg hit before the other. Louis felt a tearing sensation, then scorching pain in his ankle and knee. Louis couldn't bear any weight on the leg. Two POWs supported him while he hopped back to camp. He was removed from barge duty, but this was hardly comforting. Not only would he now be the only officer trapped in camp with the bird all day, but his rations would be cut in half. Louis lay in the barracks ravenous. His dysentery, so his stomach sickness, was increasingly severe, and his fevers were growing worse, sometimes spiking to 104 degrees. To get his rations restored, he had to find work that he could do on one leg. So he's only going to get his food if he's working. Spotting an abandoned sewing machine in a shed, he volunteered to tailor or sew the guard's clothes in exchange for full rations. This kept him going for a while, but there was soon no one left to tailor for, and his rations were halved again. Such was his desperation that he went to the bird and begged for work. And this shows us how terrible things really have gotten for Louis. The bird savored his plea. He ate it up. He loved it. From now on, he said, Louis would be responsible for the pig in the compound. The job would earn him full rations, but there was a catch. Louis was forbidden to use tools to clean the pig's sty. He'd have to use his hands. So he's going to have to clean out all the pig's poop with his bare hands. All his life, Louis had been fastidious about cleanliness, so he's really particular and wants things to be really clean, so much so that in college, he had kept Listerine in his car's glove compartment so he could rinse his mouth after kissing girls. Now he was condemned to crawl through the filth of a pigsty, picking up feces, poop, with his bare hands and cramming handfuls of the animal's feed into his mouth to save himself from starving to death. So he's eating pig food so he doesn't starve to death. Of all the violent and vile abuses that the bird had inflicted upon Louis, none had horrified and demoralized him or torn down his spirits, as did this. If anything is going to shatter me, Louis thought, this is it. Sickened and starving, his will a fraying wire, Louis had only the faint hope of the war's end and rescue to keep him going. The only thing that's going to keep him going is they know the B-29s are flying closer and closer, and they're hoping the war will end and save him. But Louis is in a pretty terrible place, and that is the end of our chapter.